Okay, so um, the aim, I, I've got a, it's a re reasonably uh, short talk, just to give an overview of the, the low risk project, uh, describe some of our aims and uh, the current focus. So I, I should say before I start, this is um, it's definitely a, a team effort, the, the core team's uh, back in Cambridge, uh, we also have a number of external uh, contributors to the project including Stefan, so very many thanks to their help, for their help, and also lot, we've had lots of good advice and um, goodwill from industry already, and I'd like to thank uh, Google and um, uh, Gavin Ferris for, for actually funding the work. Um, so, so who are we? So like I said, we're based in uh, the computer lab at Cambridge, my, my day job is a, a lecturer there. Um, and uh, a growing uh, community of external contributors uh, also uh, um, help develop the project. We have a not-for-profit company, so um, this allows us to do, the idea here is we can do some consultancy work around RISC V, all for the benefit of the community, um, and also um, uh, undertake development work that doesn't really make sense in a university environment as well, so it gives us some, f some flexibility there. Um, what's the goal? The goal is to produce an open source SOC, um, support academia, industry, hobbyists, um, and anybody who wants to make use of RISC-V. Um, who will benefit really anybody hoping to um, use open source hardware? And I, I think our philosophy is very much to try and um, share and collaborate from day one. So that's really the goal of the Low Risk Project. Um, not just open source, but open development and open research, I think, as well. We're, I mean, we're very interested to talk to people about research ideas. We have a number of people that are using the, the Low Risk platform already for research projects. Um, and we're trying to be as open as possible about our research ideas as well. Um, so the origins of the project. So it started about um, three years ago. Uh, so uh, both, so I'd, I was one of the co-founders of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and Alex had um, played an important role uh, in that project as well. Um, we were, we had, so as part of my research at Cambridge, we build test chips. We, um, my research area is computer architecture, and we obviously we thought about uh, the possibility of producing an open source Raspberry Pi, but really Raspberry Pi Foundation wasn't the vehicle to do that in. The goals are obviously very difficult, different there. Um, it's really to um, promote computer science amongst children, uh, encourage people to study computer science. That was, that was where that project started. Um, by chance, we were, even though we were having these conversations, we, they weren't public, but we were approached by uh, Gavin Ferris, who's a long-term supporter of open source projects, who'd had the same idea <coughs> um, and wanted to support us in trying to produce an open source Raspberry Pi style board. So we had to think about what this would mean, how we, how we could um, get such a project started. Um, I think to, uh, the idea was that we really needed a catalyst, a group, uh, to, to, uh, to start this sort of project. It's a little bit more difficult than uh, starting a, a, a software project. Um, uh, so get a, have a core team to get the, the, uh, the project off the ground. And then produce community boards so that contributors could see their efforts uh, fabricated in silicon. Um, and then by chance, uh, at the same time, became aware of Krista's work on RISC-5, uh, so very fortuitously, um, uh, so that it seemed like the obvious uh, the, the direction to move in. Um, it was also, I think, as Chris has already discussed, it was, it was very timely in that uh, various patents were um, uh, expiring in terms of process design. Uh, there's also a convergence in, in I think, um, what people appreciated to be a, a good design uh, for, for multi-core designs. Um, we're also spending longer at, at each technology node, which I think is interesting. Uh, it's easier to build the ecosystem that you need around these ISAs as well, tools like LLVM and Linux. So um, it seemed like the right time to do it as well. <coughs> so the ultimate goal is a Raspberry Pi-like community board. The first step is really to have a re um, develop um, uh, a solid SOC platform and establish a community around it. Um, so we're building on the rocket chip generator that Krista described. Um, I think it's an interesting, it's an opportunity here to try and 
Um, it's a sort of clean slate designed to do things a little bit differently. And a couple of things we've been thinking about is we're a small team, and I think the number of uh, people that can contribute to a hardware project is smaller than the number of people that you would expect to be, uh, contribute to an open source software project. So we're thinking about how we can be as productive as possible, um, how we can make best use of the, of the community resource. So it's interesting. It's, a, it's another influence on commu computer architecture, perhaps. So how does, how does um, trying to work with an open source project, a community of uh, geographically distributed uh, contributors, how does that influence the architecture of your SOC? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, how, can we, how can we really boost productivity and reuse? And then I think the other place where we thought there was low-hanging fruit and where um, our industrial collaborators are very interested is security. So is there some uh, general purpose features we can add to the SOC that would give us a very uh, definite measurable improvement in terms, of, in terms of security and something that hopefully is a general purpose feature and doesn't just bite off one, um, uh, doesn't just address one issue with a specialized uh, solution. So the other thing we, we hope to do is not just deliver the hardware, so we're very keen um, to uh, provide documentation, provide a way in for people to contribute to the project. Um, so test benches, um, uh, tool flows, uh, benchmarks, etc. Uh, and try and make everything as, uh, as open as possible and make the project as accessible as possible. Um, I think another thing we're trying to uh, encourage and we're working with uh, the group in the uh, University of Santander in, in Colombia is to uh, encourage the development of open source, other open source hardware components such as um, the FIs, so memory, uh, memory for DDR memory FIs and uh, an other analog IP, which I think if we really want to lower the barrier uh, for people to produce SOCs, this, this is another important uh, area that we have to get right. Um, so, just to talk about two uh, uh, sort of interesting features of the low risk platform. The first one is uh, this idea of minion cores. So, I think ultimately we envisage the platform to be a network, seen as a network of configurable cores. And this is a way to try to uh, increase productivity, uh, reduce the number of uh, distinct IP blocks, and, um, and reuse. So the idea here is that you can extend the platform after manufacture uh, and specialize the platform after manufacture because more of it will be defined in software. I think this is, this is also potentially a way to uh, interact with a larger community of people uh, who perhaps there's a larger community who can contribute to that sort of firmware and software rather than uh, making hardware changes. And the other uh, the component of the low-risk platform, uh, so on the security side of things, is a general purpose tag memory system. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we wanted to explore a hardware security feature that would be uh, flexible, low cost, but give a very clear benefit in terms of security. And the, the primary focus here, initially at least, is um, mitigating control flow hijacking attacks. Uh, so tag memory is actually an old idea. It goes way back. Uh, to 1960, so the idea is you add uh, a tag or metadata to every uh, word in memory, um, and then you apply tag rules uh, when processing your data um, to restrict unwanted behavior uh, and prevent common attacks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these, uh, these components of the platform in a little bit more detail. So the initial focus for minion cores is really uh, to produce um, pro programmable I.O., very flexible I.O. This was always an issue with Raspberry Pi, slightly frustrating. Um, with a Raspberry Pi, you often want, need to add a microcontroller because uh, you want to have control over the I.O., uh, but you, 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 want to have, um, you, end, you end up wanting to bit-bang um, the general purpose I.O. pins, but that's very difficult to do uh, with the Raspberry Pi, the, 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 uh, the, the SOC architecture of the, the, the Qualcomm chip uses. Um, so really, uh, it would be good if you could have much co uh, better control over, um, over your, uh, over your I.O. Uh, and so this is one of, the, one of the hopes with using a minion core approach. So basically have a minion core close to the I.O. pins and be able to define uh, I.O. standards in software. Um, so we, we consider an minion, a minion's a, so it's a simple core, microcontroller class core, uh, perhaps some um, custom instruction set extensions uh, to, to improve performance, uh, local memory, 
Um, this idea of a hardware shim, so yeah, in the case of programmed I.O., this is something that just bridges the gap between the I.O. pins and the processor, so the processor doesn't have to do uh, all the sort of bit-level operations. So in the case of programmed I.O., it's uh, perhaps a shift register uh, and, and a programmable state machine. Um, we're also imagining many cases where you want to put these meaning cores and you want to um, have them close to applications processors, you might have some sort of low, uh, low latency interconnect between the application processor and the minion core. I'll, I'll give some examples of, of that later on. Uh, so we're using the Palpino RISC-V core. So this is a, this is a um, system Verilog uh, RISC-V core, if, if, if anybody's looking for one of those from uh, the group at ETH Zurich. Uh, and we, like I said, we're initially using this for programmable, uh, programmable I.O. But you can imagine it doesn't just allow you to define your, your I.O. protocol, but you can also use it for pre-processing pre I.O., uh, low-power monitoring, or perhaps uh, in conjunction with the tag memory system, uh, tagging the data that comes uh, from, from your I.O. Uh, and then more broadly, uh, you can imagine using minions for uh, secure isolated execution, uh, offloading particular um, work from the application processes, perhaps that requires um, uh, real time uh, has real time requirements or rapid and flexible implementation of different IP blocks. So uh, we're ho hopefully to do, doing some work to implement um, yeah, Ethernet controllers and perhaps memory controllers uh, are using uh, minion cores. Uh, you could also process. I think there's interesting things you can do if you can process uh, on chip trace information again using minion cores and then. Um, taking an approach like they have at ETH Zurich and some of the work we've done at Cambridge, uh, you can also group together these small cores as a parallel processing framework. So you can also imagine generating um, accelerators uh, with networks of uh, small cores as well. So I think this uh, it becomes an interesting, and each, the, the minion itself is something that you specialize for each application, so it becomes a, a reusable building block that perhaps, perhaps, perhaps helps you uh, boost uh, the productivity. So tag memory, uh, so the basic idea here is we're going to add uh, tags or metadata to each physical location in, in memory. Um, the way that's done, so we're going, to, a, we're going to reserve an area of memory to store these tags, and then we're going to um, append the tags to the, to the caches on the chip, and also uh, place a tag cache between the, uh, the last level cache and, and main memory to reduce the amount of extra traffic because of, these, because of this uh, metadata that you, you want to associate with each, each word that you're processing. So the registers in the processor are also extended uh, to include tags as well. Um, so, uh, just thinking about some use cases for when, you, when we have tag memory. So, it's a general purpose uh, mechanism, and we can uh, develop tag rules for different applications. Uh, here, we've just outlined a few simple security use cases. Again, uh, thinking about how we might mitigate control flow hijacking attacks. Um, so, the first one is just simply protecting code pointers. So, if we have code pointers in our program, we want to make sure that we can't uh, overwrite them. Um, so I'll, I'll just explain a little example of how we do that with, with tag memory. Um, some sort of limited control flow integrity is also uh, possible where we mark valid uh, branch targets. Um, you might want infinite hardware memory watch points, so adding canaries on the stack or um, just taking a similar approach with, with, with other data structures. So let's just, just look at one example and say a little bit more about how tag memory works. So um, tags are currently specified using a, a single uh, control register. It's, a, it's a, 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 a presently only about 38 bits. And this specifies bit masks uh, for a number of different classes of instruction that say how the tag is generated for that instruction, or um, so how it's propagated, and, and what cases would raise an exception. So what cases would trigger an alarm. Um, so uh, for the case of an ALU, uh, you might, your, your destination tag on your, rest, on your destination register might be the, will, will, will be the, you simply all the tags together on your source registers and then and them with this propagation um, uh, tag mask. And the propagation tag mask will be as wide as the number of, of tags you have. Um, and then you could also have a, uh, the exception mask also indicates, again, it's as wide as the number of tags you have and indicates when you would raise an exception when you generate that destination tag. 
them. So it's a simple example, so this code pointer prediction example. So we want to mark uh, code pointers as valid, so we're going to use a, a single one of our, our tag bits, use that to mark uh, valid code pointers, and then we're going to prevent them being uh, overwritten by arbitrary data. And if we, if we attempt to override them, then we're going to trigger an exception. So this is very simple to implement. So we choose a single tag bit uh, to implement this feature. Um, we ensure that whenever we uh, load uh, data from memory, that the, that the tag bit associated with that data is copied into the destination register of the load. So we, the, the mask field uh, will, will ensure that that, data, that that tag is propagated from memory. Um, and then we trigger, trigger an exception if during uh, an indirect branch the source register doesn't have this tag, uh, tag bit set. So it's a, it's a very simple scheme. And then for stores, um, we trigger an exception again if we attempt to overwrite a memory location that is a code pointer. Um, but we leave ourselves the option to uh, create a code pointer by, uh, um, if, we, if, we create a, uh, if we create data that, that is valid, is a valid code pointer, we mark it as a valid code pointer, we're allowed to store that to memory. So like I say, we just have these, at the moment we just have a single um, CSR register, uh, a control register in, in, uh, uh, in the processor which allows us to control all, allows us to specify these, uh, these tag rules. Um, and you can, you can imagine combining schemes, so here there's just one scheme, we're using one bit, um, and as long as you have a number of bits you can combine schemes uh, by simply creating oring the masks, oring the masks together. Um, I think there's, so we've taken, I think, a, a relatively simple, um, relatively simple approach to, to specifying tags. I think there's a really interesting design space between these um, very simple, um, this very simple fixed tag rule register and much more elaborate schemes. So you can start having tag uh, rule tables or even start caching rules as they did in the, uh, the cache safe work. Um, you can also think about extending the technique in other ways, um, so using the unused bits of the virtual address uh, to provide an ID um, that indirects to, 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 to more metadata, uh, and, and then that way you can you could provide a more general purpose capability scheme, or even um, we're looking at how you might, might track provenance uh, for, for security applications, and again, um, uh, this extra metadata might be useful for those sort of applications. Um, you can imagine that there's a, there could be an interaction between uh, these minion cores, these sort of helper cores, and tag memory as well. So tags, tag rules might not raise an exception, they might just trigger some work uh, to be done on a minion core. And the minion core might also be processing uh, trace information again to look for um, uh, security rule breaches. Uh, so uh, we're not just hoping to, so we're hoping to, to uh, uh, to, to develop the, the low-risk platform, but we're also interested in uh, contributing more broadly to the RISC V ecosystem. And one of the things we're doing is developing a port of um, LLVM to RISC V. So this is a, a prerequisite for, for lots of projects, and uh, we want to use it uh, to explore some of the use, use cases for tag memory. Um, so this is, actually, uh, Alex Bradbury is actually lead, leading this effort. Um, I think it's been very good progress to date, so I think more than 90% uh, more than, more than of the GCC torture test suite is passing at the moment, um, and which I think we should have basic support um, uh, very soon, uh, and then f I think fuller support with all the different ISA variants by the, by the end of the year. Um, so the status, so uh, please uh, visit the lowrisk.org website. Um, uh, to, uh, to, get, to get the latest current releases and tutorials. Um, as I said, I think the hope is that we provide the website over time will provide a way in to the, to this, um, to the RISC V ecosystem, good documentation um, to, 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 I think this is a really important part of uh, trying to grow the community and, uh, and uh, 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 making it as easy as possible for people to get started. Um, and we're hoping to extend the tutorials with examples of common things, common uh, extensions that one would like to make to the platform. Um, so the first release really uh, involved us um, understanding the rocket uh, chip generator, uh, untethering it from the ARM 
uh, host that, that, that was required at the time. Um, we have a, a sort of simple Verilog top level, which replaces the chisel top level, and we added the trace debug support from uh, um, OpenSock debug, um, which, uh, uh, thanks to Stefan. Um, so the next release um, should be in the next few weeks. So this will include a full tag memory implementation. Um, we've had an implementation in the past, but this, is, this actually incorporates the rule checking into the rocket pipeline. Uh, we have a hierarchical tag cache to reduce the overhead of adding tags in terms of um, uh, uh, extra traffic to main memory. Um, although the, the actual overhead is very small, um, we've added a hierarchical tag cache, which just means that if you have large areas of memory that aren't tagged, there's no overhead of having, or very small overhead of having uh, supporting tag memory. Um, we also have a, a simple GCC stack smashing protection example that makes use of, of tag memory. Uh, we've integrated a Pulpino based minion core, and it just, it, we, we run an SD controller on the minion core, um, and we can access a, a read and write an SD card from Linux. It's just an example of how we're uh, hoping to use um, this, this, these minion based uh, interfaces. So looking forward, um, so full tag memory support is going to require some changes to Linux, and we want to add support in LVM, and that should be coming later in the year. Um, more minion-based IP, so as I said, looking to do a um, Ethernet controller and um, thinking about memory controller uh, and better support for um, building systems with, with, with networks of, of minion cores. And then moving towards a more customizable and extensible SOC, uh, which is where minion cores are, are central to that, um, with system level s uh, simulation support next year. And then we're looking to develop uh, test chips and the community board as, as soon as, as possible. So funding, um, so, I, so I funded with traditional research funding uh, sources uh, to my group in Cambridge, but uh, most of the low-risk work is currently supported by private donations, and um, I'm very uh, uh, grateful to Google for their support as well. Um, as I said, we have a not-for-profit company, Low Risk CIC, that's able to do um, consultancy work in this area. I think, I think that there's a number of different companies we've been talking about. Um, some of them uh, talking to, I think so, some of them are interested in specific uh, work, but I still, uh, and, and others are um, in, interested in just trying to uh, ensure that the Risk Five ecosystem grows. But I think in both cases, um, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities to to um, uh, to open source much of the much of the work that comes from uh, from, from, from 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 those interactions. As I said, all the profits go back into uh, supporting the project and the community. Uh, the goal of RID Low Risk is to support the community um, and, and uh, be disruptive, but be disruptive in a, in a positive way. So, um, so I'm very uh, optimistic about RISC-V. I think we've, my observation is I think we've passed the tipping point that it is going to happen. Uh, there's going to be a rapid growth in the, in the ecosystem. I think the uh, the tools are developing very quickly now, um, and, uh, and it will it will happen. Um, I think it's going to be great if I think so. I think it'll have a very positive um, impact, um, and it'd, it'd be great if we see uh, many more design starts because of this. Um, people really being able to create derivative designs very easily. Uh, we talked about the need for specialization, um, but from a, a power point of view, and I think RISC Five. Uh, and the open source um, implementations of RISC V that will be, they're already out there, will make this much easier. Um, uh, and really allow people to focus on uh, the, you know, the innovation and differentiation. Uh, so designing those accelerators rather than the, the, the boring bit, the, you know, the, the in, to, in, sorry, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but boring bit to, to some extent, which is the, the sort of SOC glue. Um, and actually, you know, to, it's interesting talking to companies that build these sort of SOCs and, and uh, it's actually interesting, you know, a number of them uh, are, are sort of limping along with older SOCs and you need to upgrade that part to, to support higher performance um, uh, accelerators, but that's not the key. I mean, really, it's the accelerator and the overall function of the chip they're interested in. Not, they're not really interested in uh, reinventing the wheel in terms of the SOC infrastructure. So I think there's, there's lots of great things that can happen um, uh, once uh, uh, RISC-V, um, once, once the ecosystem really becomes uh, mature. So I think the other, the other really positive 
uh, impact will be on academia. So, um, I, I, you know, the work we do at Cambridge, we're, we're working in computer architecture, and I think there's, there's hope. I think um, it's very frustrating, actually, that it's very frustrating and and uh, and quite surprising, really, that we've that we've survived so long without an open source uh, instruction set. Um, I think it's, it, it will have a really positive impact on um, enabling uh, full stack research projects where um, you can make a change to lots of different layers of the stack and, and have very detailed, um, uh, uh, make a very detailed evaluation uh, of the impact. And I think that's something that's very difficult to do in academia um, unless you're the very largest uh, you know, best funded groups in, 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 in the world. Um, I think it would also make it much easier to transfer ideas quickly to industry, again, if they've been, if they've been proven um, on more com complete um, uh, systems. Uh, I think there's something really exciting as well about having competitive implementations where you can compare your work uh, to other academic uh, contributions much more easily. I think there's something that uh, is perhaps lacking from um, the, the, a lot of the work that we, we currently see. Um, another thing that I'd like to see that, that, I've, that is very difficult is producing test chips at the moment. Uh, I'd love to see more uh, sharing in that um, area, sharing of packages and PCB uh, designs, for instance. So we're, we're, actually, we're borrowing um, a, a, a package and PCB design from Michael Taylor's group at UCSD. So I think that, that kind of work is also great. And it, it's all, all part of this effort to try and make it easier, lower the barrier um, to, uh, to chip design. Um, I think RISC-V will also help in the availability of good reference designs. Um, perhaps we can share good flows as well a little bit more. Um, um, and then I think the final sort of part of the puzzle is these complex IPs, so memory, memory FIs uh, and PLLs and things, which enable uh, many more groups to produce um, significant uh, test chips. <laughs> So as I said, so collaboration is really the central to the low risk project. I'd really like to talk to you, understand what your priority, priorities are, and what, you, what your particular interests are, um, whether there's potential for collaboration with low risk. Um, so I'll obviously be around for the next couple of days. Um, uh, and I think so if you're a student, uh, so low risk is, uh, again, uh, a GSOC, Google Summer of Code, our umbrella organization. So please take a look at the website. I think there should be a, uh, a blog post very soon. <laughs> um, or have a look at the, uh, the Google site. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's going to be some great projects this year. So uh, be, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good way to start uh, um, getting involved in RISC-5. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I mean, most people in the risk of community have been focusing around using OpenOCD for the transport layer and GDB, but we, uh, we know we're talking to many people companies that uh, GDB is the last thing they think of using, and so much are interested in commercial tools they're used to. And I know that a number of the commercial vendors are interested in porting their tools once the debug specification is ratified. So my personal recommendation is GDB or perhaps LLDB, but LLDB port doesn't exist yet. Yeah, so LLDB later in the year, once we've... Once we've uh... Maybe. <laughs> yes? Props, can you just have, you made passing reference to Alpino Core being the system very Yes. Uh, it's written originally in system very not in Chile. That's right. Oh, that answers my question that I asked. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, look, the, yes, uh, please, so the, uh, oops, yeah, where's the, uh, yeah, so pulpplatform.org for the uh, ETH Zurich work, yeah. I think there's only one risk factor, right, which is... Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Chris has said there's only there's only two cores which are actually written in Chisel, um, which is Boom and uh, Rocket. So I think we we had a uh, we, we should put the we've actually got a survey of all the RISC V cores. We should put it up on the website because I think there's about there must be 20 or 30 now. Um, so there's another there's another system Verilog RISC V core from Cambridge, um, so from Simon Moore's group. Um, so um, there's at least well I would imagine there's at least 10 system Verilog. Uh, risk five cores. I mean, I think they're they're probably not as um, yeah, and they might be user mode only, and probably don't have the performance of Rocket or Boom, of course. Yeah. 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 
Yes. That's probably a stupid question, but how does tech memory compare to just using a memory safe language for system programming? Yeah, so, well, I, I, so the question was how does tag memory compare to using a memory safe language for pro for programming, uh, a managed language for programming. Um, I suppose the observation there is you still have to implement your managed language in, you're probably in C, uh, so having some extra protection there would be useful. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, how does this tech memory things fit into, let us say, uh, standard C software, also the Linux kernel and so on, so is this transparent in some way? Or um, so can you compile it just, uh, let us say, the next Python interpreter for your uh, open source Raspberry and yeah, so I think that's that's the hope that we'll have support in LVM for for some of these security features. Um, yeah, I mean it does overlap. So there's work at Cambridge on capabilities, and I think there's hope that some. Well, I, I hope there's some overlap in the compiler support that we need for those two um, security features. Um, but yes, I think for for some of these, for some of the, uh, the the security use cases, it should just be a matter of recompiling your software, and then it will it will have these tag memory security features in, in the, added to the binary. Yes. How would you see someone exploiting tag memory? How would someone exploit it? Um, well, so I suppose there's the, there's, the, there's the security features that we'd like to offer and explore, but then it's also, I think what's nice about something like tag memory is that it's a general purpose uh, feature. So it might be that you want to use it to improve performance, it might, it might be that you, you want to use it to improve debugging or profiling. Um, so there's, sorry, was that a slightly different question? Yeah, I meant uh, like breaking it. Uh, oh, how might you break it? So, um, so I, I, I think there. So I think there's low-hanging fruit in terms. So the the control flow hijacking attacks. I think it does make it will make that a lot harder. Um, it doesn't provide. It obviously does. And I think there's trade-offs between. Um, you, you, if you if you wanted to give if you wanted to have something that. Um, it doesn't provide full spatial and memory, memory um, full spatial and temporal memory protection as some as um, a capability-based system would. So I think there is a there's an interesting design space between something as simple as the tag memory that I've talked about today and a much more um, sort of fully featured um, capability-based system. Um, and there's also I think we're also uh, imagining with this simple system that we trust the code that you're running. Um, but there's also extensions that, you, uh, that would allow you to run untrusted code as well. So I think there's an interesting design space there um, that, we, that we're really keen to explore. Um, but yes, it's, so it's not, uh, so I think if you look at the, the recent work on capabilities um, or the, I suppose another place to look at a, a more um, complete system would be Pump from the Crash Safe work, so the, the DARPA funded project. So again, they have a much more um, complex, they have ability to define much more complex rules, sorry, they have the ability to define uh, uh, much more complex rules, but the overhead is very significant. So their overhead is around, is around 100%, is that or 120%? For pump in terms of the area of the of the processor, whereas a simple tag memory system is a few percent, and the 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 extra traffic uh, to, to 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 main memory is also very very insignificant. Again, you know, a few percent, and probably less when uh, when we get a full set of results from the hierarchical tag cache. So, it's an interesting design space. It, I think it just I think there's some really low hanging fruit. Um, in terms of the, the current vulnerabilities of processors, uh, but how far you want to go, then there's, a, there's definitely a, a spectrum there, and it has increasing cost in terms of hardware overhead. Refreshments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.